Good evening. My name is Derek Fowler, president of the Dayton Unit NAACP. Welcome to our monthly community meeting titled Survival Skills for Social Media in Our Politically Charged Culture. Tonight's monthly community meeting will be moderated by Chairman Pastor, Chairman of our Communications Press and Publicity Committee, Pastor Scott E. Sliver. Chairman Sliver? All right, thank you, Mr. President. Everybody, uh, welcome. It's great to have all of you here. Um, I, we are not, on our end, we're not concerned about the time. Um, we know that that was a lot of important business that needed to be taken care of. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in making meetings as short as possible while getting the job done. So um, we're gonna cover a lot of different topics tonight all around social media. Uh, coming out of this most recent election season. Uh, I don't know what it was like for you all, but uh, things got pretty ugly on social media uh, for a lot of us. And so we're gonna have a, just a dialogue um, around that topic tonight. That is the lens for tonight's discussion. You know, navigating social media under the best of circumstances can be really challenging, uh, aside from all of the politics. So I am uh, I'm sorry to say that uh, Erica Fields, who's Executive Director of Human Relations Council, she was unable to make it tonight, so we will miss her, but I'm excited to have Amelia Robinson. She is the Community Impact Editor of the Dayton Daily News. She's with us. Welcome, Amelia. I'm excited that you could be here. And my friend Libby Ballingy, who's a local writer, promoter, and activist, um, she's here with us as well. And so if you would, I'll just give them a, give them a clap, welcome them. And let's start with um, Libby. Why don't you just take a moment and tell uh, a little bit about yourself um, and we'll start there. Hi everyone, thanks for um, inviting me to be with you tonight. I'm a, a local writer, podcaster, and um, I guess community organizer um, is a way of saying it. Um, I've been involved in a variety of local nonprofits, most recently the Poor People's Campaign. And also I've been um, working with Dayton Heartfulness, um, which is a, a sort of a peacekeeping initiative um, that is tied with the United Nations. So um, happy to help in any capacity um, with Dayton, Ohio related things, especially social media and especially for my friend Scott. So thanks everyone, it's nice to meet you. Yeah, Libby, it's great to have you. Uh, what she didn't say is she is like the local rock and roll connection. She's <laughs> promoted lots of shows, bands, uh, all things music in and around Dayton. So she does a great job with that. Thank you. Yeah, and I was fortunate to be on her podcast uh, with Amaha Selassie and Mayor Mary McDonald. That's probably been a couple of years ago now, just talking about leadership in the west side of Dayton and, and things around that. So thanks, Libby. It's great to have you. Thanks. Amelia, are you there? I am. Floor is yours. Thanks for having me. I really am excited to be here tonight. Um, thanks for the offer, Scott. Um, I'm Amelia Robinson. I'm the Community Impact Editor for the Dayton Daily News. My job includes the Ideals and Voices pages, which is the editorial page for uh, the Dayton Daily News and uh, Springfield News Journal and uh, Journal, Journal News too. So I've been doing that about six months. I started the weekend of the um, protests around George Floyd. So it's been like nonstop since. Um, no letting up at all. I have not been able to catch my breath, but I have been um, trying hard to evolve the page into one that is more community driven. Um, the idea behind the page is to find solutions and share thoughts that improve our community. Uh, and part of that has been uh, community conversations, which is a series of uh, town halls. Uh, your, your president, Derek Fort, has been one of the panelists on one of the programs we had about voter safety in the election. So he did a great job. Um, that piece was also used in the paper on the ideals and voices section. We have uh, some other great um, community conversations coming up including things on like health disparities and um, civic engagement, sort of things that get us back to the table. A lot of the conversations have been lately about coronavirus and um, some of the issues that comes with that, including like getting people uh, to, take the, to take the vaccines, 
Um, now that they are available to our community and as more come online, as we all probably know, a lot of people are reluctant to take those vaccines. So I've been doing a lot of work with um, education around the vaccines, but um, I really encourage you, if you have an idea you think can improve our community, to reach out to me. We have some wonderful people who are in this Zoom right now. So I'm thinking all these columns you could be writing for me, always, you know, not for me, but for the community, right? For me and the community, you can write. So all you have to do is reach out to me at a Robinson at Dayton Daily News dot com if you're interested. We have some other exciting things that I'm planning that I hope to share with the community coming up soon. But I've been a um, columnist in the community and a reporter for about 20 years. And I have a what had happened was floor, since you have the floor, why don't you okay. um, why don't you talk a little bit about your journey? I mean you've been a, a columnist journalist for 20 years and then this thing called social media hit the scene. How has that impacted um, what you do and how you do it and how you interact with the public? No, no more is it I just, I write in and, and get something printed. Now it's much more interactive. What has that been like for you? As we all know, this internet thing is a big fat. It's gonna go away any minute now, right? Now it's not, it's here to stay. And it has it totally revolutionized the way we do communications and everything about our, our, our country has been revolutionized. Um, and evolved since uh, Facebook and Twitter and all the other social media platforms have come around. Um, one of the problems we have is separating, getting people to understand the difference between real news and fake news. Um, it used to be where you were competing with other news outlets to share information. Um, now you're com competing with memes. Um, in my new role, I've gotten people who say I'm wrong about stuff and they use a meme to sort of, uh, argue their pat their facts and that's like ridiculous you would say but if that's what people consider news that's what people consider news so uh get back to your point though yes social media has really changed everything uh and not always for the good yeah great thank you thank you libby um now you came i mean social media has been a big part of your life i mean for like the past 10 years or so right with everything that you're involved in Right. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a little bit about about your journey? Um, sure. I use social media for personal uses, obviously, but um, also to help um, nonprofits and small businesses um, get their messages out. Um, one kind of I think that I initially had a, a large network just because I know a lot of people from kind of a, a lot of walks of life. I just have a natural friendly personality. So I've, I've always known a lot of people. So I think I had a, um, a large network of people pretty quickly. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely been some downsides to using social media. One sort of upside to social media was being able to really help get people organized and informed after the tornadoes. Um, so as much as there has been you know, negative, the negative side of social media, there, there have been some positives um, and using my, leveraging my social media network to help organize um, volunteers and get information to victims, I feel like um, was one of those more positive outcomes. So um, kind of like have both sides of the coin for sure. Yeah, I think that's the nature of social media, isn't it? I mean, the upside is you can post things, people can share things, it helps get the word out. But the downside is no matter what you post, half the people hate what you post, unless it's something really safe and really generic. Um, Amelia, why don't you talk a little bit about what um, what it has been like, say, over the, la the past year or two, um, just sort of, uh, you know, just how tense it has been on social media and how you navigate that in, in your scope? Well, I think the Capitol riots kind of illustrated how divided we were. I feel like even before that happened, people were not aware of how deep that divide was with our country. Um, I feel like in a lot of senses, there's two um, narratives being spoken. One that, you know, people who are on one side see and another side sees the opposite. And that translates on social media where people refuse to listen to each other or take um, take a, another person's word for anything that is not seen to be in their camp. And that's pretty horrible and toxic. Um, I see it a lot in my work because I do do a lot, a lot of sharing of thoughts that are political. And uh, 
a lot of those are a lot of the arguments are based on stuff somebody saw on Facebook or on another social media platform that is not necessarily true. Um, so uh, I, I hope that um, we see that the, there's a problem and we start to do things to solve that. And one of the things we can do is be more literate um, when we read things and more uh, smarter consumers of information. Um, that's the most important thing, like to actually don't share things that are not true don't engage um, with negativity because it doesn't actually benefit our democracy. So you personally, that's sort of your, that's what keeps you on track that you just don't engage in negativity? No, I engage, I totally engage, but I don't, you know, um, it used to be where I would just spout off on Facebook. If somebody was dumb, I would tell them they were dumb. And I decided that's not getting me anywhere and that's not nice, that's not the person. It's actually hurting me to be negative, to go down to somebody else's level. That hurts me because I'm the person who gets upset about it and they're still the same way. So I decided that, you know, I'm not gonna mistreat anybody and if they don't agree with me, I'm gonna try to educate people. I'm gonna enter it with kindness. And uh, hopefully they'll understand that I'm not an enemy and I'm, you know, and I'm not like blatantly lying to them. So uh, I very, you got you had to pose a question about blocking. I very rarely block anybody from my personal or professional pages because I do want to um, have people around me who don't agree with me. You know, it's no, it's, it's no good for anybody to have like a choir that you talk to. So, mm -hmm. you know, you don't learn anything from anybody else. Yeah, true. Okay. Okay, Libby, how do you decide what you're going to engage? I mean, I know you post some things that are, I mean, you lay it out there where you stand on certain things. Uh, how do you decide what you're like, do you just get like, I can't, I just can't keep it in anymore and you put it out there or are you a little more strategic than that? I think that it just really, it's really dependent. I mean, I think that, you know, we've, we've been living through, through a time period where there's certainly a lot to be outraged about, you know, when, when kids were starting to get separated at the border or, you know, obviously when George Floyd killing happened and Breonna Taylor and, you know, the, the Capitol, um, the attack on the Capitol, I mean, there's definitely a lot to be outraged about. So, I mean, there are those moments where it's like, you know, there are some initial um, kind of pangs of, you know, I just want to, I get this emotion out there. But I also think that, um, you know, one thing that I've considered more and more as, I, as I've used social media and, and become a little bit more, um, have more of a reach is, you know, the way social media is set up is that it's not egalitarian. Um, you know, the way the algorithms work, people do have a, have a, lar a much larger reach than other people. Um, and if you're one of those people, even if it's just on a local level or there is a responsibility that comes with that. So I think that um, really, I'll, I agree with what Amelia was saying is that, you know, um, especially after the last four years, you really realize that outrage is contagious and to kind of pick your battles. It's like, you know, to some degree to be silent about some of the outrageous things that are happening, you know, feels complicit. And in some ways is, you know, I mean, um, I was reading a great quote that, you know, sometimes telling the truth requires taking a stand and um, neutrality is not necessarily always objective. And even if, even for journalists, so, you know, sometimes there is only one side of the story. And when we're living in such an age of disinformation and where people are constantly just getting their news from Facebook memes, um, to, to Amelia's point, I think sometimes it is important for us to kind of stand up and say, hey guys, this is the objective truth. This is actually what is happening. Um, because a lot of times people are just, you know, they're raising their kids and they're, they're going about their day and they're not 100% paying attention. And there is kind of a, you know, the, the flow of public opinion actually matters to people. And so I think, you know, um, I think it is important for people to, to state the truth when it's really important. Yeah, thank you. Um, got a, a question from uh, Felicia Hill, who's on the call. And she said to our guest panelists, how has the lack of critical thinking in our educational system, how's that contributed to the dumbing down of America's understanding of facts versus fiction? Libby, since you have the floor, would you like to? Sure. 
Um, well, I actually, my professional life, I actually work in the, um, in textbook pu publishing industry. So um, I've been working in that industry for 20 years. And I definitely think that teaching the tests has not been um, very productive in terms of, you know, teaching those critical thinking skills. Um, I don't think that we really teach or value a lot of the why, especially in history. It's just like, this happened in 1812 and this, you know, and there's not that like the, the real, the real emphasis of history is for you to understand the, the motivations and, and, and how people got there. So you don't make those same mistakes. And so I think when we're just kind of teaching the tests, I think we are really losing a lot of that critical skills because people just kind of scan the news for, you know, the big, the big headlines um, and aren't really doing it, you know, digging in and doing those deep dives. So, um, you know, one of the things, one of the things I was going to mention on this call is, um, you know, if I have something to, to prescribe to people, it's to read more, to think more, to, you know, to, like Amelia said, not go, not go by the memes. And, um, I think if the last four years hasn't had you questioning, um, the education, the consequences of defunding our educational system, um, that's, that's definitely been one of the things that has been a big takeaway for me personally. Yeah, Amelia, how? That too. I was just like, I wasn't thinking of that too. I think that it's easy for us to say, these kids don't like, they don't understand like we used to. But if you look at some of these, these things that are going on, they're not kids who are doing it. They're people my age and older, and I'm not a kid anymore, you know. They're, there's something about like uh, the lack of, um, uh, faith in our systems of government and um, our, our systems uh, that we've all held true. Like, uh, you know, you don't trust the, 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 the judicial branch anymore. You don't trust the media. You don't trust anything. That, uh, that says a lot about the state our country is in too. It's also, I mean, there is problems with the education system, but there's more going on there. People don't understand how the government works. People don't trust the government. People don't trust each other. And that is a very dangerous place for a, a nation to be in. So how do you how do you deal with that being a journalist? How, you know, how do you handle when people just they post things that just aren't true? I mean, there's such a barrage of that. You can't I mean, you can't answer every person, right? How do you, how do you do that? How do you handle that? You know, and, and I've seen this on the so-called left and the so-called right where people do this. And this smart people doing it too. It it, it, it irritates me. Um and I've seen journalists do it. Um I just wish that um, people would just stop and go, where's this coming from? And what does it mean? I feel so, I feel like one of the things about social media is it's just like an impulse. It's like, I'm going to share this. I'm going to comment here. I don't have to think about it. So I feel like if we just stop sometimes, and this is one thing I've, I've learned over the, the years, if you stop sometimes and think about what something actually means in a, the bigger picture, you might not make the decisions you, you make. Not that long ago, it was probably in the fall, I posted just a very simple post, um, and it was a pro tip. Before you share something or before you post something, fact check it, right? Because I get, I get all kinds of things. Oh, 18 missionaries in Afghanistan are going to be killed, you know, all these things. And if you just search it, you see that these things just kind of circle back around and people just share them as though that they're real. And so I said, pro tip, fact check before you post or share. And I gave, um, I just found a website that had 10 different fact checkers with all of their credentials. You know, uh, there were charts as to their leanings, you know, which way they lean. And I posted that and people still, well, you can't trust the fact checkers because they're, you know, they're all backed by blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, so, you think it's okay to not fact check because you don't like to your point, Amelia, people don't, they don't trust anything or anybody, but yet they'll believe a meme or an infographic that just pops up on their news, news feed and share it like it's true and perpetuate that stuff. It's crazy to me. Um, so I think, am I right for all three of us that our personal and professional lines are very blurry? Would you I'd say that? Libby for you? Personal I, would, I would say that to a certain degree. Um, 
I do keep um, professional separate, like a separate professional Twitter account and that kind of thing. Um, so I, I mean, there's definitely some blurring though, for sure. How about for you, Amelia? I decided a long time ago that I wasn't going to do that whole like separation of church and state sort of thing because it didn't really make sense to because I have a lot of people on my personal page that I don't really know personally um and I'm like I can't post I, I basically decided that I'm not going to post anything on social media that I wouldn't post on my professional page because it all comes back to me anyway mm -hmm. um a little different situation than a lot of journalists because I am allowed to um share my opinion about things so you know I decided you know, that if that's the case I'm in, I can do that. But I also have to be very cautious because I am representing my company. Um, at one earlier in this last year, I was at a, a friend's house during the COVID-19 lockdown when it first happened. And somebody saw my, my picture on Facebook and they decided to try to get me fired, basically, and report me to uh, my employers, which it was a dumb thing. They would, never would have worked anyway. But... <laughs> page it was a shoot good luck with that over something like that uh it was just like you know it was on my personal page so that's kind of illustrates to me that it doesn't really matter what you do if, if you know somebody wants to get you they're going to try to get you Libby do you how often do you um engage somebody okay say they're coming at you uh, how do you how do you handle that do you answer things or do you let them go or is it case by case what it's for me a little bit case by case I mean I think it depends on how it's approached like if it's super hostile and um I can tell that they're just trying to troll me or something then I don't really engage in that um if it seems legitimately like they're confused or they want clarification or there is you know there's even sort of a fraction of you know I'm willing to be even a fraction open-minded about this. I'm, I'm usually willing to engage. Um, but you know, on Twitter, there's a lot of bots and stuff like that and, and just, you know, trolls and things like that. So usually I just block and move on because, um, okay, so you've used that term trolls. I'm guessing there are 35 people in the room. So not everybody knows what a troll is. Why don't you just <laughs> kind of define that? Um, you know, I guess for me, it's just people who are, um, I'm on, I'm to the left side of the, the political spectrum. Um, I'm not far left by any means, but um, some people on the right just feel like anytime they can sort of, um, you know, just jump on somebody's posts and, you know, basically just try to, try to, you know, get under your skin on purpose. Um, you know, own the, own the libs, um, that whole thing. And so, uh, I know a lot of those people, you know, even personally, and it's, they, they just, that's what they, that's what they get off on. And it's just like, I'm just not going to give it to them. Yeah. I mean, I, I have people that I don't hear from unless they disagree with something I've posted. <laughs> and it's the craziest thing, you know, yeah. they just, like all of a sudden they come out of the woodwork and really trolling is almost a sport now. I mean, yeah. I know people that just go, oh yeah, well, I, I know so-and-so and I just like to give them a hard time. And these are otherwise normal, you know, emotionally healthy, <laughs> smart people that just go, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go give them and I just can't stand them and I'm just gonna, and it's like, why do you, why you gotta be like that? It's kind of like the same a little bit as almost like road rage or something. I feel like it's that a similar impulse. You know, they're, they're like otherwise completely normal people, but get irrationally upset about um, certain issues, I guess. Well, yeah, and you throw in a pandemic when we're all kind of cooped up at home more than usual or mm -hmm. almost entirely. And, you know, you're working at home, you're taking a break or you're laying in bed and you can't sleep and then you just start doing that. So, yeah, things can. So, Amelia, for you, how do you, I mean, I know you say you don't, has he, have you ever gotten like in trouble? You know, you post something and then you get called in like, hey, you need to be careful about this or do you have a lot of freedom? Well, I mean, I've gotten into with um, some elected officials in town here over different things. And, you know, they say, don't do that. <laughs> 
in the way you did it. Like, it's not wrong that you engage with people, but you should um, do it more. You should do it smarter. Years ago, I did did something like that. But I've never really had my knuckles smacked or whatever over anything I posted or said. I try, I literally try not to disrespect people. I get like some very like hostile emails from um, from readers who you know have been told to hate the media and that I'm a socialist and I'm evil and I'm this and I'm that or I'm a nastier worse than that. And I just try to I try to reason with people because I I do think that people um, are fundamentally good. And a lot of times they're just frustrated because they, and they don't know who else to take out on it. So they try to punch me. Yeah. Um, I'm not gonna take every punch, <laughs> sure. But I do try to reason with people and hear them out because a lot of times people just legitimately wanna be heard. You know, frustrated for whatever reason. And I'm the target. You know, I find, I find that if somebody comes at me over something, um, I, I have my defenders, my loyal, you know, you can't say that to Scott, you know, and they'll start jumping on. And then suddenly there's this little war going on on my page and I'll, I will delete the, the strength that, that whole line. And um, I will message them both and say, Hey, you know, you want to, you want to fight this out, fight it out on your page, not my page. And I'm also pretty quick. One thing that I've found is that if somebody's coming at me, if I send them a private message, like on Facebook Messenger, and just say, hey, um, tell me where you're coming from on this. And it's amazing how quick people are to back down when you just respond to them and ask them, like you said, Amelia, people want to be heard. Hey, tell me, hey, I, I, I noticed you were saying this. Can you send me, send me a link to that? I'm interested in hearing that. And it's amazing how that will diffuse so much um, just by reaching out to somebody privately. You know, yeah, I think it was Sarah, Sarah Silverman um, a couple of years ago. It was kind of famous or something, like a, whatever. Um, some troll went after her about something, and she just basically went to the guy's page and kind of like looked at him. And you know, he had been posting some like really sorrowful kind of things about his personal life. And then she said, well, you know, hey, I'm sorry you're having a hard time. I really do think that sometimes people, re, you know, use social media as a weapon because they're having some sort of deficiency in their lives. So I really, that's one of the reasons I don't take a lot of things that happen online personally, because I do think people are hurting, especially now with the pandemic um, affecting so many people's lives, which kind of explains a lot of that anger great thank you uh we got a question from uh loretta williams um and she said this if money time or politics were not an issue what steps would you take to reach out to our youth to help them become more critical activists libby you want to take that you got a big smile like huh <laughs> Um, I'm really a big proponent or I, I'm supportive of the idea of, um, public service after high school. Um, even just, I mean, not necessarily mandatory, but I mean, even just a year, um, serving your community, like in an AmeriCorps type of, um, atmosphere. I think that there's so many benefits that you don't even realize that you get out of it. I mean, um, first of all, you, you meet so many people from different walks of life. Um, you understand, you, you learn at, a, at an early age, the impact that you can have um, on different communities, um, just from your efforts, you know? I think we, we so often just push, push young people into, you have to go to college and you have to start your career and you have to, you know, and like, you're just thrown into, to, you know, school and debt and the whole, you know, everything so quickly. And I think that we just kind of get on this sort of capitalist ladder, you know, immediately. Um, you know, I think if, if young people really, if we valued that experience of public service, I feel like people would, would that would be something that they would hold on to the rest of their lives and, and really champion causes, so. Yeah, what do you think, Amelia? We, I don't have a good answer to that, but I do think that um, one of the problems with the way um, a lot of young folks are being raised right now is that they don't 
um, they're basically in a box like their parents. Like they, uh, they go to school and they come home and they don't see people who aren't like them. And um, I think that's really bad for our country. Uh, so anything that kind of gets kids to experience life from somebody else's um, shoes would, um, I think, help that out. Because you see that everything is not so cut and dry or black and white. There's nuance. Yeah, you know, in my case, um, you know, I don't lead with the fact that I'm a pastor. That's way down the list on my resume, even though that's my day job. Um, my kids really don't know, <clears throat> they don't know life without doing food outreaches. Um, uh, like our church at Christmas, we did 500 complete, we called them turkey dinner kits, where it had a 20 pound turkey and then all the trimmings were in a box, you know, everything you need pretty much. And so my kids were sort of raised in that. And what I found, uh, I mean, I think I, you both know both my, my sons, Matt and Zach, and they're both involved. It's really interesting watching them sort of find their way. Um, you know, they've kind of watched me step into this, uh, like being on the NAACP and I'm on the community police council and different things like that. And, you know, Zach got a mural um, on the side of Blind Bob's, he went through all the steps, he raised all the money because he wanted to do uh, something for the shooting victims to, you know, memorialize them. And uh, my son, Matt, you know, was involved in the uh, Dayton Inspires and doing cleanups and whatnot. And it's, it's just been interesting. I think just if you raise your kids and they just, you know, actions speak louder than words, right? And they watch how you live and you're involved in things. Um, my son, Zach, uh, was with me. There was a sort of a sp almost spontaneous MLK uh, march and we got coffee and donuts and Zach showed up and helped me serve coffee and donuts to people. So, you know, they, I don't really think they really view it as like, well, I'm gonna get involved or I'm gonna do these things. It's just kind of how they, how they do life. So uh, Loretta, that's a, a great, great question. If anybody else has questions, um, just put it in the chat. Um, make sure you hit uh, everyone so it goes to everyone, not just to me, so that everybody can see your question. And we'll try and um, address those things. Okay, so we're at uh, 20 minutes to late. We have a, a, a few minutes. Um, I'll, I'll ask you this. We'll get right down to it. I mean, we all have friends on both sides of the aisle. And I, I noticed, Amelia, you posted a there was an opinion article that uh, you posted. I think it might have been on on Martin Luther King Day, and I noticed that that one kind of like. So you know, we have all these people that don't always think like us and see the world the same way. How do you how do you manage that? How do you navigate that? You know, personally with your like your friends, especially who think very differently. I think he might be talking about, was it about um, Rob Scott who, um, was it about Trump? Yes. Yeah, because okay. he ran, he ran uh, Trump's campaign and he was the small business administration. And I noticed that created quite a stir. Oh yeah. Um, so <laughs> the reason I actually asked him to submit, to submit that because it gets, it gets back to the fact that I want to understand people. I'm like super curious about how pe other people think. And I don't, I don't want to judge how you think. I want to ask you and you to tell me so I can understand you. Um, the first, the thing about the First Amendment is that people like the First Amendment for themselves and uh, nobody else. So it extends um, to the tip of your nose. Um, but really the First Amendment is about expressions for everybody. You want to hear from other people. You want to understand other people. So I posted this, um, this column that he wrote for the page. And I, I knew people wouldn't like it because my, my people on my page are very opinionated and, uh, and you know, true to form, they were very opinionated. They didn't um, see anything positive about um, Trump's administration. The thing though is that people who support Trump do find things that are positive about his administration and, and pretending like those things don't exist does not mean that, you know, they're gonna change their mind. They still are gonna believe what they believe. And so, mm -hmm. Does it make more sense to hear them out and, and try to understand where they're coming from or just kind of like shut them down? I feel like you should hear from other people. Yeah. So. Maybe anything? 
I'm sorry. I just was reading some of the questions in the in the chat. So remind me of what your question oh, that's was. Okay. How about let's move on sorry. to that? Because I was doing the same thing. Uh, Ter uh, Terrence Williams asked, "What is the best advice?" Man, this is this is such a good question, Terrence. What is the best advice you would like to share with our youth on the use of social media and pros and cons, as it were? Well, how about this? It never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> what you post is there. Well, I think too, that totally speaks, people can see you, <laughs> like, you're not uh, just talking to your friends, Every, you know, and all this can come out at the end of uh, the day and bite you in the butt. So I would just, you know, make sure kids realize that. And also, there's some nasty, gnarly people out there who would do you harm. Uh, my husband hates that, you know, I, you know, people know where we live. But you know, whatever. Um, so kids have got to be careful on social media and just realize that everybody who want, who just because it's called your friend does not mean they're actually your friends. So, yeah, I would say that, um, yeah, to be very careful. I'm, I'm so grateful. I didn't grow up with social media because I was a little bit of a wild child and I can only imagine. Oh, um, <laughs> um, but I would say that, you know, the, the thing that's really kind of neat about it um, is that, you know, kids can have the ability to make such an impact on the world. I mean, look at Greta Thunberg with, you know, her climate activism and that kind of thing. And that wouldn't have been possible without social media. So, I mean, if they have, if, if you have a young person who really um, feels the need to be like a force for good in the world, um, it definitely can be a tool to, to help them amplify that kind of message. Oh, that's good. Yeah, very good. Well, hopefully that uh, answered all the questions in the chat. Um, Mr. President, you got your ears on there? Hello, 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 hello. Derek, are you there? Mm -hmm. He must have us muted or something. I'm not sure. Okay, well, I'll pose one more one more question here. This will be our final one. And uh, hopefully Derek can jump on here and wrap us up. What do you think? Yes. There you know. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, well first of all, I want to say um, uh, thank you, uh, Chairman Sliver, uh, you know, for putting this distinguished panel uh, together. Uh, and, uh, you know, it never fails. I, you know, last year at the last moment, I asked you to, you know, could you do January? He said, sure. Uh, and you did the same thing this month. So I want to say thank you very much for putting this distinguished, you know, this distinguished panel together. And then I want to say thank you to our panelists. Uh, you know, Amelia, uh, who, who does an outstanding job. Uh, when I look in the newspaper, see her big smiling face inside the paper, see all the different panelists that she has. Uh, you know, on the different Zoom calls. And then uh, Libby, we met before, we may have met in, in the past, or our paths may have crossed at some point, uh, but, uh, but I appreciate uh, all the hard work you do inside the community as an activist, uh, you know, and uh, I'll just say for to both of you, to keep pressing forward towards the mark. Uh, you know, each one of you all deliver good services uh, to our community, and, uh, and we respect what you do. So uh, that's about where we're at. And uh, certainly appreciate everybody for joining uh, our monthly community meeting this evening. Uh, next month, uh, we're going to be talking about environmental and climate justice. Uh, so uh, we're going to have our chairman, which is Chairman Attorney Gary J. Lepla. Uh, he's going to be moderating that session uh, next month. And we're going to be basically talking about greenhouses and uh, you know, how we can um, bring energy uh, to our community uh, and you can get off the rails. So uh, that's going to be happening next month. Uh, uh, you know, Amelia, and you know, Amelia, hopefully you can help cover that in the paper for us. Uh, maybe get with our uh, new chairman of our Environmental and Climate Justice Committee and, uh, and really start promoting this because it, it, it's something that Central State, my alma mater, is working on with the edge of my community to try to make this happen. So uh, and it's, way, well, you know, it's long overdue. And it's something that, uh, that I know that will serve our community very well. And once again, uh, to Chairman Sliver, 
uh, Amelia Robinson and Libby Ballinger. Thank you very much. And to everybody else who joined the call and everybody online, all of our online activists, close to 10,000 online activists of the Dayton Union and the we appreciate you as well. Take care. May God bless you. May God bless the NAACP, and may God bless these United States of America. Good evening. Thank you.